And I think far too few people stop and realize how many critical conversations they had in a day, a week, a month, that if they just prepared a little better for, their impact in the world could be insanely different. Hi, I'm Brilliant, your host for this show. I know that I'm incredibly blessed. As the son of self-made billionaires, I've seen the high price some people pay for success, and I've learned that money really can't buy happiness. But I've also had the good fortune to learn directly from many of the world's leading teachers. If you're ready to be, do, have, and give more, this podcast is for you. My guest today is Phil Jones, author of seven best-selling business books, creator of the Exactly series. The book I read in preparation for this interview was exactly what to say, the magic words for influence and impact. I love the book so much, I made myself some flashcards of these various phrases used at certain times in certain ways with a certain purpose can have an incredible impact. I'm already seeing that in my own life and dreaming of ways I can use them in a variety of situations going forward. Phil has founded five multi-million dollar companies. He's an entrepreneurial success story One of Phil's essential messages, one I believe in so strongly that I just ordered the t-shirt, change your words, change your world. In this interview, we talk about what it means to be a decision catalyst, how the enemy of yes isn't no, it's maybe, how to get through that, help other people make up their minds, doing all of this in service to something more than just your own checkbook, your own ego, how to actually enjoy what you do, to be good at it, to serve others. This conversation is at the heart of so much that matters to me and so much that I teach. I'm really grateful to Phil for being a guest on the show and what he shares about writing, I think is awesome. I think you will too. So you can find Phil on the web at philmjones.com on pretty much all the socials. With that, I hope you enjoy this conversation with my new friend, Phil Jones. Phil, welcome to the School for Good Living. Hey, a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah. Will you tell me, please, what is life about? Oh, ho, ho, ho. I wish I knew the answer to that question. What is life about? I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, to me, life is about making a contribution that matters, challenging yourself to do better for others on repeat, and being on the relentless quest for better. Mm. In, in whatever you've decided better means. That's that's kind of, for me, what life is about. And also trying to leave your corner of the world slightly better than you found it. And I think that's a little cliche, sure, um, but still equally true, which is perhaps why it's become cliche. Yeah, no doubt. Well, tell me, so we've got the whole thing about what life is about. And we'll just move to something easy, like who are you? <laughs> and what oh, is real you? easy, real easy. Yeah. <laughs> who am I? Oh, geez. Um, again, I love trying to figure that out is, is I'm a relentlessly curious individual, which I think has led through the bulk of my body of work. And I'm very comfortable in knowing what I am, what I'm good at, what I have strengths in, what I don't have strengths in. I'm also very comfortable in knowing that I'm not fully formed at this point of time is it, it, and, and hopefully I never am. I hope I'm, I'm a work in progress forever. A- and I've lived a life that's gone through perpetual change and, and a variety of reinventions from you know, early professional career to now. So I'm, I'm comfortable in the fact that who I am is, is in some ways somebody who's open to organically evolve in a fairly rapid period of time and can change who I am through conditioning and through purposeful growth and decisions. Mm. So, so that, you know, that, that kind of cryptic answer (laughs) probably leads to the fact that I, you know, I'm I'm an entrepreneur through and through. I'm a people pleaser. I love my, my currency or metric of success is other people's success. Mm -hmm. So I love hearing other people have been more successful and I had a part to play in that. And I'm quite happy to be a tiny line item in the credits. I don't need to be the, you know, the celebratory victor of, I could only do this because of you. Mm -hmm. I I like being in the background of other people's success stories. Yeah. I know that you have been in the background and continue to be of many other people's success stories. Now having started five multimillion dollar businesses, being an entrepreneur yourself, um, having 
sold more than a million books in this exactly what to say series, which um, I read your book exactly what to say the magic words for influence and impact. I love this book. I was telling you before we re recorded, started recording. I actually made flashcards <laughs> for this. I'm so happy with this. Yeah, which uh, I just hope that whoever reads this book has a high ethical standard because some of these things I can see how they can be very influential. And yeah. uh, so I, I'd love if you maybe the place to start is you introduced me to this idea of magic words. Right. When, when you talk about magic words, what do you mean by that? Um, what I mean by magic words is words that talk straight towards the subconscious brain. And, and the subconscious brain is powerful in the decision-making process because it's a little like a computer. It has a yes output and a no output. It doesn't procrastinate on its decision-making. Subconscious is, is on reflex. It's impulsive. So if you can talk to the part of somebody's brain that makes decision on reflex, then what you can do is you can increase the rate of decision. And if you can increase the rate of decision, you can often increase the rate of action or transaction that comes behind it. And what we're doing is, is utilizing existing pathways that, that we've trained ourselves on as human beings, not just through our life, but through generations of life prior to that, um, that says, well, if there's a hard way and an easy way of communicating a message, why are we picking the hard way when the easy way is an option? So magic words are words that talk straight towards that. And if people are unsure what the subconscious brain is, is, is see it as nothing more than the little voice inside your head. And if for any reason you're thinking you haven't got a little voice inside your head, I'm telling you now that's the little voice that's telling you you haven't got a little voice. Like we, we all have one. And the ability to talk to other people's is, is something that can really make an impact on, on getting stuff done. Magic words are, are a way of me simplifying complex. Yeah. And if you're talking about the book, exactly what to say it's 23 sequences of words that can be utilized in a variety of different life scenarios to be able to help you get a fair advantage in critical conversations. Now that book could have been 30 books, you know, could have been, you know, pages and pages and pages of methodology of neuroscience of psychology, et cetera. But what I decided to do with that book was instead of, teaching you the principles so you can create examples. I teach you examples so you understand principles. Mm. And I think what it's done, and certainly you know, nearly five years into the launch of that book being real, what I've learned through feedback of others is, is people get it and then they get it more over time as they start to unpack that principle in other areas. So it's giving a very narrow example of how reciprocity can actually deliver you a increased return or how curiosity can be used as a fuel to have a more meaningful conversation, right? There's deep rooted principles in there, but tiny micro examples. So you can get into the application. Yeah. And something I really appreciate is at the end of the book, you write that, you know, everything you've learned in this book is simple. It's easy to do and better still it works, but what it does not do is work with all of the people all the time. Right. <laughs> as much as we might call these magic words and we know they are effective, it's not like they're actually going to hypnotize people or, you know, force them to go against their deep seated values and so forth. But if we're, if we're intelligent, uh, we can recognize absolutely that life really is a series of patterns, right? right? And we recognize those patterns and we use that to our advantage. And I love to the term you use, you say it gives you a fair advantage. You're not sure. talking about exploiting people or manipulating people. You're just talking about being smart, being careful, having a goal, working to serve others. I understand is a huge current of this work. And people think that the, the enemy of yes is no. That's what too many people think. They think like if I'm urging somebody towards saying yes, it's because they really wanted to say no. Mm -hmm. That's manipulation. The, the, the true enemy to, to progress in most scenarios is maybe. Mm. Indecision is the enemy. And, and what the work in exactly what to say does is it, it, it helps people steer conversations towards moments of decision more freely. And, and I think when you take your role in, in conversation as a leader to say, well, actually, I'm a decision catalyst. I'm here to help people make their mind up. Mm. And you abstain from what their mind is. You just take the role of saying, I'm going to help you work through a decision-making process. Then you can end up with more yeses if yeses is what you're chasing purely by default of the fact that you can have more meaningful conversations. But you shouldn't chase the yes. You should chase the decision. That, that is a huge insight. And um, I actually, I really nerd out on this because I know as a coach that ultimately success, happiness, health, like these kinds of things don't come about because we try harder. 
right. right? They come, they don't come about because we want it more, or even because we've learned some single technique, they ultimately come about because we have a change in identity. Yep. Right. And one of the things that you introduced me to, I love this term decision catalyst, but the other one, the phrase you use in the book that I really love was a professional mind maker. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so people reading this, whether you're in sales, whether you're in leadership, seeing yourself differently, your role differently, that's huge. It, it changes the framework, right? It, it changes the lens. It changes the perspective. And, and, and many of the word examples in exactly what to say help you do that. They help the other person approach the same problem from a different perspective, or they move the finish line on what we are calling success. And what it does is it presents new solutions because you're now viewing the thing from an entirely different angle. And, and that that is something I think more people should do. And it's kind of fun. I, I, I've rewritten exactly what to say recently. Hmm. And in May of 2022, um, we release a special edition and it's expanded. We work into other areas of life. The first book was really written through a business and a sales lens. We've blown up this example to be in life, in family scenarios, having conversations around some of the things that really matter that create friction through political agenda, through you know, uh, you know, decisions about what's right and wrong about medical things, et cetera, is, is, is I wanted to create a tool that says, can we enjoy the gray space of conversation more freely? Can I help people understand there are tools where you don't have to agree to have a meaningful conversation that allows you to be able to change your mind? You don't have to change your mind all the way to their mind, but you could still change your mind to a new perspective from engaging differently with others. And my belief at this moment in time is the world would be better if more of those conversations happened and yeah. happened in a safe environment where you could enter into an, a conversation for something you didn't agree with, leave that conversation not agreeing with that other person, but having a different point of view. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think the world could really benefit from that, especially in this day and age where technology, like social media in particular, makes it so easy just to step into an echo chamber and find all the people who, disagree, who agree with you and avoid the people who disagree with you. Right. And you just get positive reinforcement around any one given belief without consideration to an alternative reality. Yeah, no doubt. Well, and I'm super grateful for this book too. And I'll definitely look forward to this, this new version because my eight-year-old is so savvy. She is so smart. She will say, like, even when she was six, she would ask a yes or no question. And then she would follow it with yes or no. <laughs> can, I, can I, yes or no. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Uh, so this is great. Um, okay. Uh, a question. And we've talked about these. Maybe I'll pull one from my deck and Do just it. see what kind of scenario we might use it in. All right. All right. Seven, two, three, four, five, six, and seven is just out of curiosity. <laughs> okay. Um, often we find ourselves needing to or wanting to ask rude or obnoxious questions. Mm. And we want to get straight to the point, but we can't ask rude, obnoxious questions because they're rude and obnoxious and we don't want to be seen as rude and obnoxious. Well, you can actually ask just about anything you choose if you create the right kind of framework and purpose for why you are making that ask. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a classic scenario in a business world is, is a common objection that we get is I just need some time to think about it. Yeah. You get that objection a lot. And what you know in your hearts of heart is they probably don't mean they're going to go home, sit around the dining room table, do a SWOT analysis of whether we will or won't. More often than not, they're pushing this away for another day. Yep. What you might want to say back to somebody in that scenario, if you've got some conviction and confidence, is you might want to say things like, like, like what do you want to think about? Just tell me I can probably help. But we can't say that that's rude. Right. What you can do, though, is you can soften rude and direct questions with the phrase just out of curiosity by inserting a curious purpose to your ask, which now gives you the ability to ask just about anything you like. So in that scenario, you could ask just out of curiosity, what is it specifically you need some time to think about? Mm. You're now more likely to get the truth. Think about, though, how this can be used in other areas of life. Think about the fact that your child has behaved in a way that is out of line with your value system and you want to call them out on this. Yeah. Could go like, what, the, what were you thinking doing that? And what do we end up with? We end up with a uh, he said, she said, they said argument. Yep. If we say, listen, Amelia, just out of curiosity, 
what is it that made you think that that was the right choice of action in that scenario? It's a lot harder to not give a mature, honest response. Because what you're saying with the just out of curiosity preface is, I'm confused. That's what you're saying is you're owning the fact that I don't understand. I'm confused. Something doesn't add up in my world. Help me. That's what you say with that preface. And that's why it softens. And, 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 you know, I'll show you a business example. There's There's a life example, but even, you know, even a leadership example that you want somebody in your team to, 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 to change their behavior or to take on new areas of responsibility or do something that is above and beyond their existing job description is, is look how the preface helps. It's like, you know, just out of curiosity, like, like what would it take for you to consider maybe moving geographically for you to get you know, an elevated promotion? Mm. The preface gives the other person permission to give a more full, complete, honest answer. Yeah. No, that's, that's so good. And, and so many of these, they, they are, again, they're simple. They're so simple. And one of them, I specifically, another one I specifically wanted to ask about, you say, I love this. You say two words, just 10 letters have been responsible. They're possibly responsible for more of your negotiating success yep. than any other single strategy you have played in your business. I, I'll tell you the words, right? Just to prove how much I know my work. We're, uh, we're talking about the words, most people. Yes. And their application is, is so plentiful to a point that it shows up in my vocabulary tracks, I would say, multiple times every day. Mm. And the reason it's such a powerful sequence of words is when it comes to decision making, as human beings, we're nervous to make a decision, particularly an isolated decision. We like safety in numbers. This is why we'll believe 37 strangers on a Yelp review than we will over any recommendation from our mother-in-law, right? It is, is we like this. Other people have done this before me. Therefore, I'm making a smart choice. I'm not at risk. I'm not going to appear to be stupid. Yeah. That is a psychological truth. What we then also have, though, is that we often find ourselves needing to advise people or tell people what to do. Yet the trouble is, is people don't want to feel like they're being told what to do, but they do want to know what to do. And you need to tell them what to do without them feeling like they're being told what to do. And we create this giant riddle. Right. How do you deal with that riddle? Well, what you do is you suggest something slightly to the left or to the right of somebody and you add weight to it. You do it by utilizing the words most people. So instead of me saying brilliant, what I think you should do is I say brilliant, what most people would do in your circumstances is. And you go, well, I guess I'm most people. And I know there are people listening in right now that would be like, that would never work on me because I'm not most people. And you know what I'd say to those people? I'd say, look, don't be like most people. <laughs> so what you can do is, is, is as long as you've got the emotional intelligence to say, am I speaking to the 90 or the 10? Yeah. I can use the words most people to help lead a next step, lead a next action. I need that emotional intelligence because – Without it, what you can do is you can shoot with the 90 to the 10 and you can miss bigger. <laughs> you with me is, is, is you can miss bigger, but it, it just becomes a very natural way of you being able to be remarkably suggestive without being directly suggestive and, and utilize the power of many in any recommendation. Yeah, a- absolutely. I, I remember when I studied in Japan many years ago that, um, seeing how the culture is different, but we're all similar and that we, we do want to know what other people are doing. We do want to know what works. We do want to know what to do. Just like you said. And I remember going into this ice cream parlor and the people in front of me were just asking, well, what did the people in front of me order? Right. <laughs> what, yeah, yeah. what do they have? <laughs> it's so funny. But and you go into a restaurant, you don't understand it. You're like, you're like, like Hey, what's good? Like, yeah. like, what do most people, what's most popular? Yeah. Or even people will say, well, what do you like to the server? (laughs) But the emotional intelligence side of things you need to understand, because my wife, every time we go into a store, she'll pick up something she likes. And the second that somebody says, oh, that one's been really popular or most people love that, that goes straight back on the rack. Mm. Yeah. Right. So so is there are people who who are happy to be part of the pack and there are people who definitely don't want to be part of the pack. And that's why you need to understand who you're talking to. And just because everybody loves something doesn't mean the person that you're speaking to is equally going to love it. Um, you've just got a tool to be able to say, which side of the line am I going to talk to? Yeah, no doubt. 
Well, then biologically, this makes sense because the image that's coming up for me is the water bottle at the drinking hole, right? Is yeah. it safe? <laughs> is the crocodile going to get me or, or are there something drinking? And I, I think I wrote in the very first edition of the book is, is I remember a period of time um, where I was like 12, 13 years old on holiday vacation with my parents. And, and, and I think we're in Greece somewhere and we're up on a cliff's edge. And, and I remember it like it was 80 foot high. It was probably like nine feet high in truth, but I remember it like it was 80 foot high and, and nobody wanted to jump off, you know, the edge of the rocks into the, into the kind of ocean lagoon thing that was beneath it. Uh, and everybody wanted somebody else to go first. But once somebody jumped off, landed in the water, came up, didn't die, everybody was happy with it being a good idea. Yeah, it is okay. that same psychological principle is nobody wants to be first. Yep. Well, then two other two other words that you talk about being super powerful are don't worry. Mm-hmm. Right. Again, two two words that are so simple. Why? Why is that so effective? And how do you? Uh, use it? Well, the first thing it does is it recognizing the fact that the other person is experiencing a worry. So instantly, the second that you empathetically utilize the words, don't worry, you get the tonality on this wrong, or you say it in a patronizing way, what you have the opposite effect. Um, Mm -hmm. But if you can recognize that somebody is dealing with a, a series of worries at this period of time, and you insert don't worry, what you're doing is you're sharing the burden. Mm -hmm. You're recognizing that somebody is struggling with something and you're giving a version of like, I'm in this with you. What you have to do, though, if you're going to utilize the words don't worry, is is you've got to follow it fairly quickly. Like, it's not a complete sentence. You can't say don't worry. Yeah, like it just ameliorates every concern. Yeah, it's not not that. I I can say, look, you know, like, don't worry. You know, we've been in situations like this a number of times in the past. As hard and difficult as we're experiencing this at this very moment in time, I have every belief that three, four, five weeks on from now, we're going to be out the other side. Whew, there's some relief. Hey, don't worry. You're bound to be feeling nervous right now. But remember the fact that you've been trained, you're prepared, you're ready. Like you, you got to follow it with the truth. But if you didn't put the words, don't worry first, then what you're doing is if I just come and said to somebody, look, look you're prepared, you're ready. You're, you've done the work ahead of this. You're good. It doesn't stop them worrying. Yeah. It's don't worry. And then reason why not to worry. Yeah. And the result that you're looking for is not that they're not going to worry, it's that they're going to worry less mm-hmm. or they're going to have now a system to organize their worry. Yeah, that makes sense. Let me ask you a question that's maybe, at least I see it, a bit of a meta, a meta question. Okay. A teacher who suggested to me, his words were, the essence of communication is intention. And I was like, what? what if the essence of communication is intention. What does that mean? And what would I do with that knowledge and so forth? But what I'm aware is, right, motive matters. The energy or the intent behind what we say is going to affect and all the other things, what's going on in the space, what's going on in someone's life. But how do you see the, like the energy or the intention that we put behind any of these magic words making a difference in, in the result they produce or how they're experienced by another person or by us? I, I think your intention should always be for the benefit of the other person first. And, and, and in which is often you need to have an internal vision that says, I see past this moment. Mm-hmm. Like you're going to use this with real wisdom it is you have to be able to be like a masterful chess player can see three, five, seven, nine moves ahead. You have to be utilizing this for a change in direction, but you already know the next three, four, five moves where this is going as well. So, mm-hmm. you, so your intention needs to be to redirect and move towards a greater outcome for all parties involved. I wouldn't say the essence of all great communication is intention because I've seen some very well-intended communications that have resulted in disasters. Um, I think a greater... There's a framework I spend a lot of time teaching, and I think there are three critical ingredients that are essential for any meaningful conversation. And the first is curiosity. Mm. If you communicate first from a position of curiosity, you stay in the safest space in helping support other people. And, you know, I can intend to help you be more successful with your podcast, but if I start raining advice on you, then I live in that world of prescription before diagnosis is malpractice, right? Which we see happen all the time. 
Yeah. So regardless of intention, your starting place should be curious because you should accept that you do not know enough. Mm-hmm. That should be the starting point of every conversation is you do not yet know enough. So start from a position of curiosity. Curiosity should then dance you towards empathy. And empathy is like a buzzword. People think it's fun. Still very few people understand what it means. The best definition for the word empathy, I'm borrowing from an author friend of mine called John Acuff. And John Acuff describes empathy as to care about what the people you care about care about. You can't get to that without being curious for long enough. And then the mistake that many people make in communication is they're looking to be right as opposed to get the right result. Hmm. Two very different things. Now, if we're going to focus on that empathetic viewpoint is too often a conversation is you versus them. Whereas what your goal is, is it's you and them versus it. That's what we should be focusing on is getting to a position where it's you and them versus it. Now, if the it is, you know, improving our marriage, fine. You and them versus it, not you versus them. If the it is, well, we need to be able to make more money. We need to be able to save time. We need to be able to actually improve the commu- culture, community of our people, etc. That's the it. But if you don't get to the it, friction, friction, friction. Yeah. Curiosity unlocks friction because it brings you towards empathy, which puts you on the same side. Mm. Only then do you need the third ingredient, which is one of courage. And when I talk about courage, I'm not talking about like climb a mountain courage, jump out of an airplane courage, go to war courage. I'm talking about the courage to just ask for things. Mm. My personal belief is that your success is in direct correlation to the quantity of quality asks that you make in your life, period. Yeah. And that is the ultimate factor towards achieving any version of success. It's the quality of quantity uh, asks that you make. Yet the trouble is, is people know that they're supposed to ask for things, but because they ask for things without being curious or empathetic first, they're rude, they're pushy, they're obnoxious, they're self-centered, they're manipulating, they're all the things you don't want to be. Whereas if you're brave enough to be curious for longer, to reach empathy, your ability to ask is the natural next step. So the essence to quality communication in my mind is do that three-step dance on report, repeat. Curiosity, empathy, courage. Curiosity, empathy, courage. And watch how they all feed each other if you understand it's a dance routine. Mm. And it's not linear. That's what other people think about is that successful communication drives towards a finish line. I'm like, uh-uh. Now, we want a never-ending story. Yeah. Not a finish line with little checkpoints and victories on the way. Yeah, that's right. That's is maybe some referred to, and I know Simon Sinek's one of his recent books is Infinite Game, yeah. right? That this as much as we want life to be neat and tidy and check a box and reach a goal. And so that that's not, it's just all the way back to the beginning you talked about. We don't necessarily know exactly what we are, but whatever we are, we're a work in progress. <laughs> right, right. So that's, that's really beautiful. Well, thank you for that. Okay. Well, I know we've covered so much already and uh, I, I would love to move us to the enlightening lightning round, but uh, before we do is what haven't we talked about that you think would be of value to the listener, if anything, and we can come back to that. I know we have more time. I, I mean, it's a, it's a loaded open question that I <laughs> take to anywhere, anywhere I choose. Yes. I, I think if we're going to stick on this area of word choices, it's probably the most prolific thing that I'd ask everybody to remember is this key point. And it's a point I want nobody to forget. And it's probably the most important thing that I could share in this entire discussion. And it's, um, when is the worst time to think about the thing you're going to say? The moment you're saying it? Yep. And the number of conversations that people step away from thinking shoulda, woulda, coulda, when if they just took a beat or a second prior to that critical conversation and thought, what needs to come out? What are the potential consequences of me getting wrong? How high stakes are this? And actually gave themselves a little bit of pre-brief as opposed to a horrible debrief. Chances are they will have a better exchange that achieves better outcomes if they're prepared to do the work before the work. And I think far too few people stop and realize how many critical conversations I had in a day, a week, a month, that if they just prepared a little better for, their impact in the world could be insanely different. 
and I give context for that is I speak professionally, have done a number of times. If I'm speaking for an hour and I've got 800 people in the audience, I'm not responsible for my hour. I'm responsible for their 800 hours. And I think more and more leaders should give consideration to just how responsible they are for moments of other people's time and get ready for those exchanges so that what they can do is bring value towards those hours, those minutes, et cetera, in a different way to which everybody could win from. I wish that too. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. that. That's a keen insight. Okay. Uh, let's move to the enlightening lightning round. So again, this is a series of questions on a variety of topics. Okay. For the most part, they're pretty short. My aim is to ask the question and stand aside. I might tug on a few of your responses here and there, but uh, other than that, I'll keep us moving. Okay, question number one. Please complete the following sentence with something other than a box of chocolates. Life is like a... Life is like every movie you've ever watched, all mixed into one, where you get the ability to play any role that you choose. Awesome. Okay. Question number two. Here I'm borrowing the technologist and investor Peter Thiel's famous question. What important truth do very few people agree with you on? <laughs> what a great question. Um, just, just hit me the question again precisely so I make sure I answer it. Yeah. What important truth do very few people agree with you on? One is I believe that very strongly that you can, that most people massively overestimate what they can achieve in a decade and underestimate what they can achieve in a day, which is the opposite to how most people teach that lesson. Most people say that people will um, overestimate what they can achieve in a day, but underestimate what they can achieve in a decade. I believe the opposite is true. And I see it show up in all areas of life, like the number of people that say 10 years on from now, their life is going to look demonstrably different. And the reality of it lives about the same. And the number of people that think they can't get stuff done in a day that I see proven time and time again, that the day can change the world. Um, so that is one that I come into conflict with folks on a, on a regular basis. Another one I'm working on is there was a study done many moons ago that that the, the interpretation of the many is that only 7% of all communication is verbal with the remaining 93% being nonverbal. It's a very popular study and it's a study that's been misquoted on numerous occasions. Obviously, as somebody who um, is passionate about the impact that words, vocabulary and conversation have on outcomes is I run into that on repeat where people are like, well, no, it's all about body language. And I'm like, I'm like did you read the study? And obviously they didn't. Um, so I find myself in conflict trying to explain to people just how impactful a subtle change of words can make towards um, any form of given outcome. So much so that, that we're just about to green light a quantitative and qualitative study uh, about just how impactful, because I know they're really impactful. I'd just like to be able to actually produce a, new modern study that takes into consideration social media, that takes into conversation the fact of how many communications happen without all those nonverbal cues um, and, and gives consideration to, to how important is our word choice. I believe it's essential, but I'd like to be able to put some real metrics around that so that um, we have new data that we can understand from as a society. Yeah, I I would like to I would like that too because I did a little googling. I won't call it research, but I did endeavor to search down that research that gets so quoted about body language and tone of voice and so forth. And the little bit that I read made me believe that is it's not accurate <laughs> the way most people cite it and so forth. It, it is miscited. It's a valuable study, and what it actually does is it it, it showcases how important those nonverbal pieces are, which was what its purpose is. Yeah. Um, but it never said only 7% of communication is verbal. Yeah. It said that 93% of outcomes are influenced by nonverbal cues. Yeah, which makes sense. In a small sample in a very specific period of time. Mm. 
So yeah, good good data, but like like the interpretation of data is is interesting. So I find myself in those kind of conflicts. All right. <clears throat> Question number three. <clears throat> this one, excuse me. This one's kind of a gimme, maybe for anybody watching the video of this anyway. And this is the question. This is how it was worded. If you were required every day for the rest of your life to wear a t-shirt with a slogan on it or a phrase or a saying or a quote or a quip, what would the shirt say? Here we go. I'll read it. Look, I can see it back in my, my, my mirror right now is, is it says change your words, change your world. Um, and, you know, we produce these t-shirts because I believe that strongly in this message. And I work with a local independent artist in uh, St. Petersburg in Florida to be able to produce the graphics around this. And uh, we produce some street art around the same piece. And, and, and it's been a little fun ride of, of being able to actually take what inside my world and my organization is a, is a strong mantra um, and carry it through way outside the book in a, in a ridiculous way. So yeah, I wear these t-shirts often. I love that. Awesome. Thank you. It's also the same sequence of words that I use when I'm signing books. Um, It also, I don't know if you've seen this yet, brilliant as well, but um, we produced a children's book. Oh, I did. I did. And the same mantra, you know, it exists in the, in in the first page of, of, of said children's book here as well. And I believe profusely that changing your words can change your world. And, and I've got countless case studies to prove it with thousands and thousands of people that it has been all the difference to them living the life that they want to be able to go on and live. Yeah. That is so beautiful. And, and part of what I really love about this is, I mean, there's, there's so much as a coach that I love about awareness, mm-hmm. right? about choice, about responsibility, about empowerment, about that. I can right change the words I use now, if only people will believe <laughs> that changing your words would change your world. You well, know, give, give the tiniest of simple examples on this is, is your answer to the how was your day, dear, question, will phenomenally change your evening. Yeah. Or it can, for sure. Right. Right. Is how you choose to answer that question can have an impact on the 60, 90 minutes, two hours that come following that moment. And even if people just think about, you know, how are they going to answer the how are you question? It's a question you know you're going to be asked a gazillion times. How are you going to choose to answer that today? These are choices. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And not just, and part of what I love about this too, is that it's not just the words you use, but the words you don't use. Right. Right. And I, I, I introduced a few books, a few um, words into my life after uh, reading a book, Tiny Habits by a guest, BJ Fogg. And he introduced me to these words every morning saying, it's going to be a great day. Yeah. Right. And this morning, that same eight-year-old that I told you about, who's so savvy, she comes into the bathroom where I'm getting ready and she says, it's going to be a great day. And then she says, I stole your catchphrase, dad. (laughs) (laughs) That's incredible. Oh, it's like, it's so great. So yes, thank you. I totally believe in what you're saying. And I'm going to order one of those, those shirts today. So very cool. Good man. Very good man. Okay. Question number four, what book other than one of your own, have you gifted or recommended most often? Michael Bungo Stanya's The Coaching Habit. Why that book? I think it is a simple and impactful read that just about any human being on the planet can get value from because we are all coaches in some areas of our life, whether we choose to admit it or not. And my strong belief in people being more curious leads to a better quality of conversation is, is amplified and exemplified in Michael's book, The Coaching Habit. Yeah. And uh, I think what it does is it demystifies coaching in a very productive way The we live in a world right now where there are more coaches than I think there are just about anything else in the planet, according to my Instagram feed. <laughs> and, and most of those coaches aren't coaching. They're advising or preaching or, um, or training or, you know, we could put a whole list of other adjectives towards it, but what they're not doing is coaching. Yeah. And Michael's book, The Coaching Habit, I think just very simply reminds people that, being an effective coach is is helping other people figure things out for themselves 
through asking a series of well-articulated questions and then leaving the space for them to answer and then being brave enough to peel back layers. And, and the coaching habit in a two, two and a half hour read, I think reminds people of that or introduces that idea to people for the very first time in a very practical way. And, and, and I'm a fan of the coaching habit because it's produced in a very similar way to exactly what to say. We, you know, we're born out of the same brain trust. Um, so I'm equally biased, but I, I probably gift a hundred copies of that book a year. Yeah. It's a, it's a great book for sure. What are you currently reading or what's in your Kindle or on your nightstand now? Oh, what am I currently reading uh, at this moment in time is I've literally just put it in my bag today is Michael's new book um, mm-hmm. that he's just released that is very prevalent for me right now. And I can't even remember its title at this very moment in time. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a new book focused on, on achieving goals and, and, and getting stuff done. And, and what I like about Michael's work is, you know, there are many of us that have achieved a number of great things in our life that have perhaps surpassed childhood ambition. And we still have a lot of life ahead of us. Yeah. And, and, and we know a lot about goal setting and we know a lot about like how to get stuff done, et cetera. And, and, and what I'm excited about with this read is, is it's going to allow me to step back into rookie mode and help redefine what my next uh, success criteria are. So I'm, I'm, I'm not looking forward to reading this book. I'm looking forward to being a student of this book. And I, I trust Michael's work implicitly. So I'm intrigued to let it be a guide for me to help uh, you know, actually deliver on its promise. Awesome. How, yeah, how to begin. That's Start doing something that matters. That's how to begin. Yeah. yeah. So good. Okay. Uh, question number five. So this is about travel. Uh, what's one travel hack, meaning something you do or something you take with you when you travel to make your travel less painful or more enjoyable? Travel hacks, travel hacks. Um, have lots of them, really. But the main things are is to always travel well. Um, and by which I mean pay the upgrade, collect the points, get the status. If they you know, offer you more red leg room, take it. If they offer you to be able to get on the plane earlier, take it. Um, enjoy the drink, enjoy the flight, enjoy the food beforehand. If you know the food is not going to be good on the plane, is, is, is lean into all the good parts of travel and, and don't shortchange. You don't try and – what I purposely try to not do is to make money out of travel or to save money during travel mm-hmm. is – it, it, my, my travel hack is to travel as well as reasonably possible to ensure that that time doesn't destroy, sabotage, bring hatred into other areas of my life. So that's probably the, the biggest sort of mindset hack that I have to it. And, you know, me spending a thousand dollars on a, on an upgrade on a seat for an airline I don't typically travel on will allow me to feel a lot, feel a lot more than a thousand dollars better and yeah. get a lot more than a thousand dollars of productivity out of that experience. Even if that's just self-love. That's great. That, that kind of reminds me of that um, Robert Louis Stevenson to travel hopefully is a better thing than to arrive. <laughs> to travel well <laughs> is a better thing than to arrive. That's cool. I like that. Okay. Question number six, what's one thing you started or stopped doing in order to live or age well? Um, started to purposefully completely change my nighttime routine and it involves going to bed significantly earlier. It involves 30 to 60 minutes of meditation or stretching or like downtime, no gadgets, no screens, etc. Currently that looks like my legs up the wall following a shower. Um, just trying to stretch out my hamstrings so that I don't become a decrepit, um, hunchback through all of the travel and the, the bad posture decisions I make when sat at a desk. So, so creating a ritual of a routine that doesn't feel like a chore that I enjoy, that is also now fueled thanks to my brilliant um, trainer coach that I work with in this space. Um, I have a chamomile tea and a magnesium tablet and I sleep better. What was the first thing? Uh, did you say, did you say a mar- a mar- oh, of tea, chamomile? Yeah, cam- chamomile tea, tea, and then a magnesium tablet. What does the magnesium tablet do for you? Um, muscle relaxant. Hmm. So right. you know, it's designed to be able to help um, muscle repair, et cetera. 
um, from from working out, but but equally, it, um, for somebody who I, I'm, I'm always on the go, I'm very anxious as a result of which, as well, there's always something to do. So I kind of live with the tension in my body most of the time. Mm. It, it helps release that. Right on. I'm going to look more into that. Thank you for that. Okay. Question number seven, recognizing that you are British, if I have that right. Right. I know it, you, not everyone in the UK is British, but right. the British are all in the UK, not physically all in the UK. Anyway, right. but you spend some time in the United States quite a bit. I understand. Well, I, I'm, I'm a British American now as well. So I'm a dual national at this time. Oh, right on. Okay. So with that as the backdrop for this question, what is one thing you wish every American knew? Oh, I, I, I wish every American knew that London and England are two different things. <laughs> um, and the, And I wish more Americans had a greater understanding for global events and global diversity as opposed to just diversity within the United States of America. And I say that as an American in this interview here is that I, I wish there was a greater empathy and understanding for more corners of our world. And I use England as an example is that, you know, every time I travel back, to the UK, to my home there, people are like, you're traveling back to London. And I'm like, well, yeah, okay. Um, when, you know, it, it's a giant small country, which I think is different for many Americans to be able to understand, but the diversity and culture in, in quite a small nation is, is really quite profound. And, and many of the assumptions that people make about the UK to the US are, are rude in the same way that many of the assumptions that people make in the UK towards Americans are equally rude because they come from a position of naivety or ignorance. Oh. And I wish more people would just shed that ignorance. And I think that just comes back to my passion that I wish people would ask more questions, be more curious and try and realize that we know very little yet. We want to think that we know so much. Yeah. So, so yeah, adding more curiosity, I think will um, just become such a fun game as well. Right. For sure. For sure. All right. Question number eight, what's the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about making relationships work? How quickly you can ruin them is there's a lot talked about as to how you can get people to know, like, and trust you. There's a lot written about as to what you can do to accelerate the quality of a relationship, how like you can enhance relationships, how what you can do is to be able to maximize and leverage relationships what really gets talked about is how quickly you can destroy one. And I, I think through my life is, is that's always been the, the strongest set of lessons is how you can destroy a brilliant reputation through one simple move or through um, treading past the line. And, and I, I'll give an example, even within my professional life that I'll, I'll own up to is, you know, I do a lot of work inside large organizations mm. And historically, I've had great relationships with many people in many large organizations. What's then happened over a period of time is as those relationships have blossomed, and I've learned this mm, now to a point that I will never make the same mistake again, is you can have too good of a relationship to a point that what happens is if you are a side dish inside that organization and hold relationships like you're an entree, then what you do is you challenge egos, you challenge the status quo. And what happens is if you are liked more than the person that should be liked most, or you are respected more than the person who should be respected most, you watch that relationship crumble. So I think sometimes the biggest lesson to have in building and maintaining relationships is to remember your role within that relationship and don't go past the job description of that role without permission. You know, yeah. Thank you for that. I suspect there are some people listening that that is exactly what they needed to hear right now. That's interesting. Thank you. Okay. Um, we talked about just about all the big things. Last one here is money <laughs> aside from compound interest. What's the most important or useful thing you've learned about money? The best thing you can do with it is give it away. And that you don't ever have money. You are 
responsible for money. Money moves through you. Money is water. Um, and you can always get more of it. Mm. It is, I know again, cliche, but it is all the money in the world and all the money that's going to exist in your world is currently in the hands of somebody else. Yeah. You just need to be able to find ways to be of enough value that people are prepared to share it with you. Yeah, and then once you've been given it, you've got to find responsible ways of giving it away. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot, lot of insight in that too. And a friend of mine, she points out exactly what you're saying. This is why we call it currency. Right. Close. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Okay. Um, so speaking of money, one thing I have done as an attempt to express my gratitude to you for the work you're doing and the time you've spent here with me sharing your wisdom and experience with me and everyone listening is I've gone on the micro lending site, Kiva.org, who facilitates micro loans to entrepreneurs around the world. And I've made a hundred dollar micro loan to a 34 year old woman named Mercy in Liberia, who will use this money to buy rice oil and soap that she will then resell. And I won't make any interest on this loan. Instead, it's a virtuous cycle where the person who will earn the interest is the field partner who facilitates it. So in this way, hopefully, I love uh, conversation has done a lot of good for a lot of people, even beyond those who will ever hear it. I love that. That's amazing. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, my, my pleasure. Okay. So very last few moments here, uh, last minutes, question or two, just want to turn the conversation to writing for a thank moment. You. Um, let me just ask you, so I'll ask you two things. I'll ask you the second, what I'd intended as the second one first, what advice or encouragement would you give anyone listening who is either actively working on getting their book done and out into the world, or it's a dream they've been harboring for a long time? What do you say to someone in that situation? Get crystal clear on three questions. The first is who are the people you're looking to help? And that can be multiples, but it definitely should be one within an army of followers. The second question is what are the challenges you're looking to help them overcome? And the third is what are you looking for this book to do in your own world? And your answers to those questions keep you honest. Because without those boundaries, what ends up happening is you end up producing a piece of work where the person you're looking to help is you, the problem you're looking to solve is ego or money, and the thing this book is going to need to do is going to be questionable. So... Having that clarity of purpose means all the micro decisions along the way become a lot easier to make. You know, this is a book to help busy entrepreneurs achieve blank. Okay, got it. And what is it looking to be able to help them overcome? Well, it's looking to help them overcome brain frog, procrastination, boom, boom, boom. Okay, got it. And what are you looking for this book to do for you? Well, I'm looking for it to be a genuine revenue stream that allows me to be able to spend more time at home with my kids. Ah, well, that's a different book than you're looking for a book that's going to put you on stage to allow you to spend 50 nights a year away from your kids. Completely different book. Is this because you want to make your mom proud? Is this because you want to win a literary award? Or is this because you want to get a Wall Street Journal bestseller? Again, all different books. But I think without that clarity of focus going in, what you do is you get lost in the creative process as opposed to the rational side of brain actually providing the boundaries for that creative process to flourish. And I think you've got to set those boundaries first. Otherwise you end up in no man's land creating a book that was only ever for you. That should have been a journal. Yeah, that's great. Or a, blog or a podcast or, or whatever else you wanted it to be. Um, and, you know, I think it's for that reason that exactly what to say is a paperback. It's for that reason that exactly what to say is 17,000 words because its form has followed its function. Mm -hmm. Every major publisher told me that it wouldn't work. It was too short. A million copies later, every major publisher is wishing they bought it. Yeah. I own all my rights. So, you know, I, I potentially in exactly what to say have an annuity for my children and my children's children. Good for you. That's really cool. Well, good. Okay. So then just the last question and thank you for, thank you for that. Um, I'll just ask, I know every artist, every creative, everyone who produces work 
that it benefits others uh, encounters some kind of resistance, at least at some points along the way. <laughs> How do you <laughs> overcome resistance on those rare occasions it shows up? Um, clarity of those questions I gave a second ago are really helpful in that because I'm not looking to help all the people. So, you know, I've got over 2,500 reviews online for exactly what to say. Not all of them are kind. And, you know, that reminder of who did I write this for? And it wasn't for those people. So, okay, well, I wasn't looking to please you. The fact I didn't please you, you like, thanks for joining the audience you, it, it is, is all I can do. So it's that reminder you can't please all of the people all the time. And also the other reminder that, that if you want to succeed in this world, world you, you've got to find a way to serve the many. And, and that means that you've got to put yourself in the arena. And if you're going to put yourself in the arena, people are going to throw spears at you. You're going to get hurt. So just get used to getting hurt. Hmm. And, and, and I think that, that acceptance of the fact that just like, like a boxer knows that you're going to get punched in the face on occasion and a UFC fighter is going to spend most of their life with bruises. If you want this personal brand space, you want to challenge status quo, you want to be able to present your ideas to the world as a, as a different reality to what people are currently living right now, don't work to get liked and expect the fact that you are going to like, like expect the friction, be ready for the punch and also decide do you wish to fight? And, and my general belief from my point of view is no, no, I'm not, I'm not looking to fight with the people who disagree with me. I'm very accepting of the fact that people would disagree with me and I'm looking to you know, water the garden, not tend to the weeds. Mm -hmm. Well said. All right, Phil. Well, thank you for that. And uh, I don't know exactly when or where our paths will cross again, but I'm sure that they will. And I will look forward to that day. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for a great interview. Thank you for the insightful conversations that you poured into the world with so many brilliant, talented people. So I appreciate your efforts of, of helping to be able to make the world a better place through your great work. So thank you. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much for listening to this episode of the School for Good Living podcast. Before you take off, I just want to extend an invitation to you. Despite living in an age where we have more comforts and conveniences than ever before, life still isn't working for many people. Whether it's here in the developed world where we deal with depression, anxiety, loneliness, addiction, divorce, unfulfilling jobs or relationships that don't work, or in the developing world where so many people still don't have access to basic things like clean water or sanitation or healthcare or education, or they live in conflict zones, there are a lot of people on this planet that life isn't working very well for. If you're one of those people, or even if your life is working, but you have the sense that it could work better, consider signing up for the School for Good Living's Transformational Coaching Program. It's something I've designed to help you navigate the transitions that we all go through. Whether you've just graduated, or you've gone through a divorce, or you've gotten married, headed into retirement, starting a business, been married for a long time, whatever. No matter where you are in life, this nine-month program will give you the opportunity to go deep in every area of your life, to explore life's big questions, to create answers for yourself in a community of other growth-minded individuals. And it can help you get clarity and be accountable to realize more of your unrealized potential. It can also help you find and maintain motivation. In short, it's designed to help you live with greater health, happiness, and meaning so that you can be, do, have, and give more. Visit goodliving.com to learn more or to sign up today.